That came to fruition in 1974 when India tested its first nuclear device. And Pakistan had already started up its nuclear program prior to 1974, knowing that India was making strides uh, in response to China. So there's a very logical sort of strategic uh, causal chain here that ends up in South Asia with these two countries who, as you know, I'm sure, have had a very conflictual relationship since they gained their independence in 1947. When I was in graduate school uh, a long time ago, 20 plus years ago now, there was a big debate about India and Pakistan and nuclear weapons. And the majority opinion in that debate was that these countries acquiring nuclear weapons capabilities was basically a recipe for disaster that we could not expect to see the same pattern of nuclear deterrence, mutual nuclear deterrence, between these two adversaries as we saw during the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union and those two countries and China. There was a very small community of people who actually were more sanguine about the prospects for nuclear deterrence. And um, I wrote about that whole debate in my dissertation. Uh, these days, 20, almost 25 years later, the debate has changed in that there is now some agreement that nuclear weapons have to some extent deterred conflict between India and Pakistan. The debate is more about the stability of deterrence. Is this a kind of delicate, maybe quite rickety, uh, mutual assured destruction relationship that could fall apart at any time and end up in conflict? Or do these nuclear weapon capabilities prevent conflict or temper the uh, temptations toward conflict between India and Pakistan? That's kind of the debate that uh, my work in this particular section of my project has been uh, anchored on. So we started out here with the map of South Asia. I'm sure you've all been uh, memorizing all of the different cities in the region. Uh, the next thing I want to go to here is a quotation that is sort of my jumping off point. Uh, this was a quotation taken from Winston Churchill's last speech to Parliament, just as he was retiring from active politics in 1955. It may be that we shall, by a process of sublime irony, have reached a stage in this story where safety will be the sturdy child of terror and survival the twin brother of annihilation. And that is a quotation that I think captures very effectively the paradox of nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons, as we all know, can cause unbelievable destruction and devastation, appalling loss of life. But it is also the fear of these things and the understanding of the consequences of the use of nuclear weapons that seems to have a deterrent effect on aggression that tempers conflictual relationships between the countries that possess nuclear weapons. So Churchill nailed this, I think, pretty early, that there are these twin effects of nuclear weapons. They're very closely tied together. And it's true that here we are in 2015, 70 years, I guess now, if my math is right, since 1945. And we have not seen the use of nuclear weapons since two countries have gotten them. In other words, the United States was the only country to ever use nuclear weapons. And it did so when it had a monopoly. So in this talk, I focus on the India-Pakistan nuclear arms competition. I want to set the stage first by talking a bit about the political context that these two countries exist within in South Asia. Up until about the year 2000, Indo-Pakistani relations were, uh, in their conflict aspect anyway, uh, centered on Kashmir. The Kashmir dispute was the main arena of competition between India and Pakistan. 
It is a disputed territory. It has been since uh, 1947. We have a map of this uh, region here. This dotted line is called the line of control. It divides the Pakistani held part of Kashmir and the Indian administered part of Kashmir. It is still a disputed territory. Both countries claim all of it to be rightfully theirs. And that was the thing that drove their competition, that got them into wars in 1947 and 48, again in 1965, and has been the cause of lots of crises and near wars between the two sides as well. India controls roughly 63% of this state of Jammu and Kashmir. Pakistan controls the other 37%. The reason these figures are uh, approximate is that the line of control stops here. It doesn't go all the way up here because these are actually glaciers in the high Himalayan mountain peaks. Just to give you some idea of this territory, we are in the Himalayan range up here. And these peaks are 17, 18, 20, 22,000 feet. So it's very uh, forbidding territory in much of uh, Kashmir. Since 1989, there has been an insurgency being carried out against the Indian government by Islamists in Kashmir who believe that India has not respected their rights, has not given them the autonomy that was guaranteed to Kashmir in the Indian constitution, and a variety of other grievances. And in that insurgency, which Pakistan has supported, with weapons and training and sanctuary, etc., some 70,000 people have died in the last 25 years. There have also been major crises that have not uh, erupted in war between India and Pakistan, but which have had a um, very sort of crisis environment to them where the international community has had to come in and sort of separate the two sides. The biggest crisis over Kashmir since that insurgency began was in 1999 when Pakistan carried out a very ill-advised operation to put its forces on several uh, mountain peaks over here on the Indian side of the line of control overlooking this little town called Kargil, which led to what becomes known as the Kargil Crisis and subsequently the Kargil War. We had a shooting war between India and Pakistan. It was, however, very uh, limited and very purposefully limited to the disputed territory of Kashmir. When the Indians discovered these Pakistani uh, incursions, they carried out military operations, some quite fierce, but by order of the prime minister, they maintained their uh, operations only on their side of the line of control. India's Air Force in particular had strict orders not to go across the line of control, so that would give Pakistan some excuse or reason to escalate the conflict. So we see something of a deterrent effect uh, from nuclear weapons there, as well as other factors that came into Indian thinking. Since the year 2000, the conflict uh, source has shifted a bit. Pakistan has developed uh, a strategy, or at least parts of the Pakistani government, namely their intelligence services, the Inter-Services Intelligence, or ISI, have carried out repeated terrorist attacks against Indian uh, cities um, and uh, sort of iconic uh, targets, both in Delhi and in Bombay, two of the largest cities in India. In 2001, there was an attack on the Indian parliament in Delhi. It was basically a failed attack, but it still killed seven people and came very close to these terrorists getting inside the parliament building and being able to do much more damage. The Indians, in response, mobilized their forces along the border with Pakistan, and we had a face-off for about nine months between two very heavily armed uh, military,
forces that were on high alert. Ultimately, the Indians found themselves to be handcuffed effectively by the fact that Pakistan's nuclear weapons were operational and the Indians knew that if they crossed the border to carry out punitive attacks against Pakistan, they ran the risk of the Pakistanis using nuclear weapons against them. In 2008, we saw the terrorist attacks in Mumbai, which I'm sure many of you saw on television over three and a half days, where uh, again, a terrorist group called lashkar e taiba uh, carried out terrorist attacks supported by the ISI. Again, uh, their targets were several luxury hotels in Mumbai, uh, the main train station in the city, and other targets. They killed 166 people in a massive uh, sort of bloodletting. Many, many, many more hundreds were injured. India here again did not respond militarily. In fact, India learned from 2001 that even going on this kind of high mobilization and alert was just going to be wasteful if they couldn't carry out some kind of reasonable, conventional uh, response against Pakistan. So all they did was basically they froze the diplomacy, they shut down relations except for the very uh, bare bones uh, necessities of communicating, and again they were handcuffed in effect by this nuclear overhang. The situation now is that we have kind of an uneasy peace in South Asia. We've seen some efforts at political reconciliation, but they haven't gotten very far. After Mumbai, India broke off diplomacy, as I mentioned. There's limited contact between the two sides today. The foreign secretaries have spoken to one another in recent years, but it's been a very uh, sterile sort of exchange of grievances rather than uh, anything more promising. And um, we have a situation where there's kind of this, you might say, a stalemate between India and Pakistan. Kashmir is simmering a little bit today, but the insurgency is nowhere near as deadly as it was in the 1990s. We have a new government in India under Prime Minister Modi and the Bharatiya Janata Party, the BJP. And that party and Modi himself have uh, intimated, not explicitly, but have talked about the need to have a more, quote, muscular response to further provocations from Pakistan. So that has people a little bit worried. On the Pakistan side, the political situation is that there is a civilian prime minister, Nawaz Sharif, but the true political authority in the country is still, as it always has been, in the hands of the Pakistan army. And in any issue area where the Pakistanis uh, see vital interests involved, the army, rather than the civilian politicians, basically calls the shots. OK, so that is a very quick overview of the political context. What about their nuclear capabilities? Now that they are maturing nuclear weapon states, where do they stand? Basically, both of these countries deploy over 100 nuclear warheads each. Pakistan is probably slightly in the lead. Estimates are 125, 130 nuclear weapons. Estimates for India are more like 110, 115. It should be pointed out that these are really estimates. They are not based on any firm knowledge, but rather on projections of the amount of fissile material that the two countries can develop and how many bombs can they produce per year. We really don't know the exact numbers, and they are, well, at least they're not in open sources anyway. Um, the weapons that the two sides deploy uh, are deliverable by both aircraft and ballistic missiles. India's preferred delivery system right now is its fighter bomber aircraft. Pakistan's preferred delivery system is uh, its ballistic missiles. The Pakistanis actually have an edge in the uh, sort of the missile race in South Asia because the Chinese were generous enough in the 1990s to give the Pakistanis 
not only the design of a nuclear warhead that allowed them to test their first nuclear device, but also transferred to them missile technology that allowed them to mate that warhead on their missiles. And so China is thought to be, or excuse me, India is thought to be behind Pakistan today. We don't really know how uh, successfully India can mate its, mis its uh, nuclear warheads to its ballistic missiles. Uh, so there's a lot of guesswork there. But again, the preferred Indian delivery system is aircraft. The warheads, the actual nuclear weapons themselves, are unassembled. They are separate from the delivery systems. So these two countries, as the US did in the early part of the Cold War, do not have their systems ready to go. They don't have the warheads on the missiles and the fissile core in the warhead and basically uh, you know, on some sort of hair trigger status, which the United States subsequently moved to as the Cold War uh, got more intense. India and Pakistan both keep all of these components separate. In India, most of the nuclear weapons components are in the hands of the civilian scientific establishment. In Pakistan, most of the capabilities, actually all of the capabilities, are in the hands of the military. In particular, the Pakistan Army, which controls all of the uh, weapons cores and the warheads and uh, all of the ballistic missiles that Pakistan deploys. In terms of their nuclear doctrines, at least what they say about their nuclear doctrines, both of these countries have announced that they're intention is to limit themselves to what they both call credible minimum nuclear deterrence. In other words, they want to have enough nuclear capabilities to be able to establish that they have a second strike capability. They can respond to a nuclear attack or a conventional invasion with nuclear weapons. But they're also keeping their programs more modest than, say, the superpowers who continued to develop thousands and thousands of nuclear weapons in different configurations. That's the minimum part that India and Pakistan say they are going to be content with. People have started asking questions about that, though, because there is much about Indian and Pakistani nuclear weapons developments that has mimicked the Cold War in recent years. The first thing in that context is that both sides are actively pursuing a nuclear triad of weapons that can be delivered from land-based missiles, aircraft, and from sea-based platforms like submarines. They're not there yet, but they are moving very fast. India has a no first use doctrine. India claims that its nuclear weapons are only there to deter nuclear attacks and that it will never be the first country to use nuclear weapons. After a nuclear first strike, and here's another mimicking of the US Soviet situation, if there's a nuclear strike on India, they pledge that they will respond massively, massive retaliation, direct uh, lift from the Eisenhower doctrine of the 1950s. Pakistan has a different mindset. Pakistan says we are the weaker party. India is much larger. Our concern really is an Indian conventional invasion. And so our nu nuclear weapons posture is intended to deter such an invasion. This is basically the same posture that the United States and the NATO alliance had during the Cold War in Western Europe, basically pledging that because their conventional forces were so much smaller than those of the Soviets and the Warsaw Pact, that there might be a need to resort to nuclear weapons in response.
So two elements of this competition get the most attention today from analysts. The first is that India's frustration at not being able to respond punitively against Pakistan for these various provocations, they've tried to escape that dilemma. They've tried to kind of slip out of those handcuffs and think of ways that they might respond with limited conventional options. And these have come to be known as cold start. Some people call it a doctrine of cold start. It's not a doctrine. It's not established operational policy. But the ideas fit well under that umbrella. What cold start means is that India, in case of a future terrorist attack, mass casualty attack, basically says that it is reserving the right, the option to carry out limited attacks across this international border that would not penetrate deeply into Pakistani territory, but would, with air cover, grab territory, uh, establish control over it, and basically use it for political leverage to try to get the Pakistanis to modify their behavior. Part of the thinking behind this is that in the past, India has taken weeks and weeks to mobilize its forces. And by the time it has been able to do so, the international community has jumped in, especially the United States. There's been a lot of pressure not to respond to Pakistan's provocations. And ultimately, the Indians find themselves not being able to do anything and just basically having to suffer the consequences of repeated Pakistani-sponsored attacks. So these cold start options anticipate a much faster mobilization, a rapid deployment of forces, three, four, five days, and starting cold, literally cold start means when you turn on the armor and head across the border, you can do it quickly and grab territory before political conditions make that inadvisable. Predictably, the Pakistanis have responded directly to this cold start set of options. I'm going to kill myself on that thing if I'm not careful. Um, the way the Pakistanis have responded is by something called the Nasser missile system. This is a tactical nuclear weapon system. Tactical nuclear weapons are short range nuclear weapons that can be used on the battlefield. The range of this uh, four missile system is 60 kilometers, which is about 37 miles. These weapons can be uh, tipped with small nuclear warheads called tactical nuclear warheads that can be used to stop armor that is rolling into your territory. Or at least that is the hope. Why have they developed these tactical weapons? Basically, they want to have a nuclear deterrent option that addresses India's conventional forces directly rather than maybe a threat to use the weapons against Indian cities and population centers. So what the Pakistanis say basically is, if you cross into our territory, you run the risk of us using these tactical nuclear weapons against your forces. The reason I put the picture up is I think sometimes when you talk about battlefield nuclear weapons, it's hard to visualize what they are all about. Basically, this is a truck that makes this missile system mobile. It can roam around. It can be camouflaged. It can move. It can uh, basically be as nimble as possible so that it can't be targeted by the other side for destruction. India has said that its nuclear doctrine is not limited to attacks on its own territory. In other words, if Indian forces are operating in Pakistan in response to a Pakistani-sponsored terrorist attack, if there is a nuclear strike by this 
system against Indian forces, that will potentially bring about an Indian nuclear response. And that nuclear response, again, they say is massive retaliation. So the issue that gets the most attention, just to bring these pieces together, basically is that if everyone does what they say they're going to do in case of a conflict breaking out, we could see the first use of nuclear weapons since 1945. People also point to a lot of other potential uh, instabilities. We have obviously between these two sides very constricted flight times. We have a, uh, a context where they have uh, iffy command and control systems that we don't know a lot about. So there are possibilities of the inadvertent or accidental use of weapons uh, both sides in previous crises. Uh, that I've written about have shown that when uh, push comes to shove, their intelligence about each other is extremely poor, very worst case based, always overestimating the threat, and people fear that that could be a cause of escalation. And of course, any escalation runs the risk of perhaps bringing about a nuclear conflict of some kind. So obviously that's a pretty grim scenario. There are, I think, other ways of looking at this that I think are less grim. What this scenario kind of pulls together is that there's going to be this sharp escalation in sort of a blur of conflict. The fog of war is going to set in with misperceptions and inadvertence and basically there's going to be no way to stop some sort of inexorable momentum toward war. If we pull this apart a little bit and go step by step, I think it points out to us uh, benchmarks or thresholds in this equation that uh, at least give me a little more confidence that we're not going to see some sort of wild uh, escalation to a nuclear conflict. So let's go step by step. The first step basically is presumably Pakistan's. No one would be surprised to wake up tomorrow morning and find out there has been another Pakistani sponsored terrorist attack in an Indian city that's resulted in great loss of life. What we are likely to see very quickly is a lot of pressure being brought to bear on the Modi government to respond in some way. However, there are lots of inhibiting factors that I think will come into play in Indian decision making and have come into play in the past. And I think the Modi government, despite its rhetoric about a more muscular policy, is going to be facing some realities that are uh, much more daunting than their rhetoric might suggest. First of all, it's hard to see what Pakistan gets out of punishing India militarily. With each episode, with each provocation, India is viewed as the victim. Pakistan is viewed as the aggressor. India's main focus now is economic development, continuing its liberalization program, growing at fast rates economically, creating a larger and larger middle class. Much of this depends on foreign investment and nothing inhibits investment in your country better than people thinking you are on the brink of war and possibly even nuclear war. Secondly, in terms of a political goal, hard to see what India would accomplish here as well. Nothing would make Pakistanis rally around the flag more than India crossing the border for the first time since 1971. The terrorists will not be put out of business. 
they are safe and secure in their sanctuaries. And in fact, this kind of response, if India responded with its conventional military, is exactly what they want. They want to set off some sort of cataclysmic conflict between India and Pakistan. Third, of course, is the risk of a Pakistani nuclear reprisal. Most people think that India would prevail in a short, sharp, conventional conflict and that they would succeed in grabbing territory. And then the obvious question arises, what then? Will the Pakistanis just roll over and say, OK, you know what? We're out of the terrorism game. No, they don't even admit they're in the terrorism game. It's hard to stop doing something you don't admit to do it. What they would do is obviously continue to fight with conventional weapons, but also very seriously consider the use of these tactical nuclear weapons. And the Indians really would have no reason to assume Pakistani restraint. Pakistanis have attacked, provoked, gouged, poked India repeatedly over the years. And you know, if I'm a decision maker in the room with the Indian prime minister and he says, what do you think? Might they carry out their threat to use these short range missiles against our armored columns marching into Punjab in Pakistan? I would say, I think it's quite possible they would resort to that. So I think here on the Indian side, there is going to be a lot of pause. They know that they would have the last best chance to avoid this escalatory spiral. They would not want to let that uh, spiral get into Pakistan's hands. And there are, I think, a lot of factors that would encourage Indian strategic restraint. What if they did, though, decide that enough is enough? They're going to send their army across the border. They're going to teach Pakistan a lesson. They're not going to attack in such a way that threatens to take over Pakistani cities or sort of decapitate the north from the south. But they're going to grab territory and teach the Pakistanis that these attacks have to stop. Then the third step is in Pakistan's hands. They also, I think, will have reasons for restraint. They say that they will respond with these weapons against Indian armor. I think there are lots of reasons, though, they would think better of that idea. In the first place, India threatens to respond with massive retaliation. So clearly, there's got to be some thought that the Indians might actually back up that threat. There's also the fact that Pakistan would overnight become the single most vilified pariah state in the international system. It would effectively replace North Korea for that top spot. <laughs> and Pakistan would come under enormous pressure and sanctions and diplomatic ostracism, et cetera, if they used these weapons. There's also, for Pakistani planners, the issue that they would be considering using their weapons on their own territory against Indian forces. This is the border area we're talking about. Sialkot is one of the most militarized of all Pakistani garrison cities. Lahore is 20 kilometers in. It is the second largest city in Pakistan population-wise, millions and millions of people. These are important population centers, and the Pakistanis are going to have to think about they might be killing their own civilians. They might be spreading radiation around their own territory in extremely unpredictable ways, depending on what the weather is doing at the time. They have lots of uh, things to think about in terms of casualties and uh, future effects of using nuclear weapons that you know, really, I think, are going to give them pause. And that's what the Indians are sort of counting on.
Then if they did respond with nuclear weapons, of course, then the next step would be India's. At that point, all bets are off. All analysis is just sheer speculation. Uh, nobody knows what's going to happen when uh, nuclear weapons start being used. Um, I wouldn't even hazard a guess. I think it would be extremely chaotic and hard to predict and potentially extraordinarily devastating. Is everybody really depressed at this point? Okay, I'm here to give you some therapy. There is yet another way of looking at this. And again, this is a minority position, but it is, I think, compelling, worth thinking about, and certainly worth talking about as we look at this situation in South Asia. If we look at this situation through the lens of what is called existential deterrence, I think it is possible to be more calm about the possibilities that this situation throws up. Existential deterrence was a concept invented by McGeorge Bundy, who was Kennedy's and Lyndon Johnson's national security advisor in the 60s, meaning he was by Kennedy's side during the Cuban Missile Crisis. His view in his writings after he retired from government was that nuclear weapons deter by virtue of the fact that they exist, that's the existential part, that everyone understands their devastating effects. They deter because of the consequences of their use, not because of the capabilities people deploy or the doctrines that they claim to have or the credibility and resolve, all of the conceptual architecture that the deterrence theorists came up with during the Cold War. All of those things for Bundy go out the window when things are hitting the fan in a political crisis between nuclear weapon states. Nobody can predict the final outcome of any kind of escalatory process between two states that have nuclear weapons. And because decision makers understand this, according to Bundy, nuclear weapons induce caution, not aggression in their possessors. One of Bundy's interpreters is a guy by the name of Mark Trachtenberg, an international historian who is actually in the political science department at UCLA. And he puts it this way. The mere existence of nuclear forces means that whatever we say or do, there is a certain irreducible risk that an armed conflict might escalate into a nuclear war. The fear of escalation is thus factored into political calculations. Faced with this risk, states are more cautious and more prudent than they otherwise would be. So Bundy is basically saying that people look for ways not to escalate, not to fall into that escalatory spiral that I laid out about 10 minutes ago. What he's basically saying here is that all of those potential instabilities that I talked about, the unpredictability, the possibility of inadvertent use of weapons, all of those things are understood. Those dangers are understood and they, in this weird paradoxical way that nuclear weapons have, they may promote stability because people don't know what the outcome will be. The technology imposes itself on human decision making. Bundy says in a memorable line from uh, one of his uh, memoirs, I've watched two presidents working on strategic contingency plans and what interested them most was simply to make sure that none of these awful events would occur. Existential deterrence rests on uncertainty about what could happen, not what has been asserted. And of course, it is what India and Pakistan have asserted that has people 
very alarmed in certain quarters about the possibility of escalation. There's a lot of uncertainty in the India-Pakistan case. We don't actually know how many weapons they have. We don't really know where they are. And if they're mobile, they're moving around. We don't know. They may be camouflaged. They have decoys. There are all sorts of ways of being deceptive with your weapons. We don't really know what their mating capabilities are. We don't really know much about how their weapons are stored in terms of the, the delivery systems, the fissile material core, and then the warhead. We don't know really if India has operational plans to do some sort of a cold start type of operation. Just this week, I was reading very serious analysis in international security, the premier uh, international security journal. And basically, the author makes the point that Indian forces have not been configured in a cold start type of way. In other words, they have not been deployed closer to the border in smaller sort of rapid deployment formations. We don't know a whole lot about Pakistan's tactical nuclear weapons. We don't even know if they're deployed. We don't know if they've successfully miniaturized a warhead that can be put on top of them. We don't know how reliable those systems might be. We don't know if the authority to use those weapons has been pre-delegated to commanders in the field, as it would have to be in the context in which tactical nuclear weapons get deployed. There are lots of things we don't know. And in Bundy's perspective, those things create the uncertainty that, at bottom, deters political actors from aggressing, that makes them think about ways to pull back. The question is, do Indian and Pakistani decision makers know this? And a lot of analysts in the West suggest not, which I actually think is kind of insulting. I don't think this is really kind of higher math here to understand the consequences of even a small exchange of nuclear weapons. And to suggest that Indian and Pakistani decision makers, most of them extremely well-educated or well-trained military officers, don't get this equation is, at a minimum, ethnocentric and arguably worse. But a lot of American, British writing, European writing on this nuclear competition suggests that they are complacent, that they don't quite get it. They don't seem to realize what they're being faced with. I go to a counterfactual. And the historians in the room might be rolling their eyes. I don't know. But if I think about the last 25 years, and I think about some of the things that Pakistan has done to provoke India, and I imagine those things being done outside of a nuclear context, if you take nuclear weapons out of the picture and ask, would India have observed this strategic restraint absent the threat of some sort of nuclear reprisal? My answer is no. There is no way that India would not succumb to the pressure to respond in a directly punitive military fashion. I think I am close to running out of time here. But basically, we have come back full circle to Churchill and the paradox that the same qualities that make these weapons so horrifying are the exact qualities that might just impose a condition of deterrence. He doesn't say that word. but. He talks about safety and survival. It seems that that comment from 1955 is still very valid. No matter what you think about this nuclear competition, really the important issue is how might this deterrence balance fail? How might deterrence fail? If historians were looking back on the India-Pakistan nuclear war of 2020, 
what would be the story they would tell? What's the narrative? How would that have happened? What's the causal chain? And what can be done to prevent that sequence of events? Here's where it's tempting to come up with a seven point list of policy recommendations. I'm going to avoid that temptation. There are absolutely no easy answers in this whole issue area, unfortunately. There are, I think, a couple of good common sense guidelines that I want to throw out there to kind of transition us into conversation. The first guideline, and some of these we're doing quite well, and some of these I think we can improve on in terms of the international community, the United States, other countries that are concerned about these issues in South Asia. The first thing we can do is to work very, very diligently to sustain and nurture our relationships with both of these countries. Some people have asked me in classes and in conversations, well, you know, now that the United States is retrenching from Afghanistan, we don't really need Pakistan anymore the way we have since 2001. And why don't we just kind of cut them off? Why, you know, they've been playing this double game and you know, we can be done with them. We, we don't rely on them now to carry out operations in Afghanistan. And my answer to that is basically, you cut the Pakistanis off, we have no leverage with them. We have no access to their senior leadership. There is no trust there. So if things do start happening, <laughs> as they have in this region five or six times since 1990, we will not be able to reach and influence the people that we need to reach and influence. One of the reasons that President Obama has made such a priority of getting to know Prime Minister Modi is that he understands, for all the criticism, President Obama gets for not doing the kind of personal relationship executive diplomacy, he understands that he needs to have a very close pick up the phone anytime relationship with Prime Minister Modi so he can talk to him at a moment's notice and they have a foundation of trust and the United States can influence India if and when there's another serious mass casualty attack in India. Secondly, we can do more, I think, and this sounds so trite, but it's true, we can do a lot more to promote bilateral India-Pakistan diplomacy. You might think that we're actively doing that all the time. We're actually not. India has successfully kept the international community out of, for example, resolving the conflict in Kashmir. India has basically said there's no role for third parties or the UN or the US or anybody. This is between us and the Pakistanis. And because of that, because people don't want to jeopardize other aspects of their relationship with India, there's kind of a complacency. We don't necessarily spend enough time talking to the Indian and Pakistani leadership about getting together and trying to get a grip, not maybe resolving this conflict overnight, obviously, but pursuing confidence building measures and other forms of active diplomacy that will promote stability. The third thing I would throw out there very quickly is that we can do a lot better at empathizing with their strategic predicaments and not being hyperbolic or overly alarmist. When analysts in the United States talk about India and Pakistan in a way that suggests that they don't understand the capabilities they're dealing with and that they're right on the brink of some sort of nuclear war and you don't have to do much of a Google search to come across a lot of that analysis, basically what happens is the other countries tune out we are not listened to, and that's unfortunate. So if we're alarmist and we're ringing the bells and we're kind of chicken little, the sky is falling, 
Indian and Pakistani interlocutors just say, you know, this is just, this is not accurate. We understand the risks. We understand what we're doing here. It's not to say with, you know, that we have to con condone what they're doing. We don't have to, but we have to understand it. After all, they make the point to us all the time that we are possibly the safest country in the world in 2015, yet we continue to deploy thousands of nuclear weapons. Hundreds of those nuclear weapons are on very short fuses with respect to Russia these days. You would be very surprised, I think, to learn that the alert status of those weapons has not diminished since the end of the Cold War. The numbers have gone down tremendously with all of the arms control processes, but we are much more operationally at the ready to use nuclear weapons today than either India or Pakistan is. And, oh, by the way, your tax dollars are about to spend somewhere around 30, 40, 50 billion dollars on a modernization project for America's nuclear capabilities. Because a lot of those weapons are aging. We're not retiring them, we are extending their lives and replacing them. So their point is if we feel the need for this kind of deterrent effect from nuclear weapons here 25 years after the Cold War ended, imagine what they feel being still immersed in their own Cold War. Their situation has not changed. And their situation is very conflict prone. I think I'd better wrap up here. I had a couple of more things, but we are at 5.08, so I think I'm going to stop. I'm going to open things up and hopefully uh, field some questions and start a dialogue, and I look forward to your questions and input. Thank you. Yes, Aaron. So one of the, uh, I guess, uh, bases for cooperation that, I guess, have been at the forefront of uh, Indo, I guess, Pakistani, uh, a potential for cooperation might be, I guess, energy security. Um, and one of like the more recent attempts is the construction of the Indo-Pakistani Irani pipeline, uh, which would go through Balochistan, I believe. And so I, I know it's been like something that's been in discussion for, for like over a decade, <coughs> yep. but it keeps on going back and forth in kind of like a, a seesaw of like, oh yeah, Pakistan is very invested in the project and then suddenly turns off. What might be done to, I guess, better promote that sort of cooperation so that you can talk, so in, in the grand scheme of things, when, you know, when there's discussion about cooperation between India and Pakistan to, you know, to build that sort of framework. Uh, it's a great question, Aaron, and you, you obviously have profited from being in Poly 488 this semester, <laughs> Politics and International Relations of South Asia. <coughs> no, just kidding. Um, there have been, as you know, I'm sure, competing proposals for different sets of pipelines that involve South and Central Asia. And the oil companies are in it, you know, obviously up to their necks and promoting different things and lobbying, et cetera. I think, uh, all of the proposed plans of the last 10 or 15 years are unlikely to go anywhere now because of what we just learned a couple of weeks ago about China's plans to invest upwards of 50, 60 billion dollars in Pakistan in infrastructure, in ports, in transportation routes, and things like that, essentially to create their own corridor from Western China down to the Arabian Sea. And I think, you know, that is so much more, so much easier and palatable for Pakistani leaders than to have to depend on pipelines that, you know, involve the Indians and the Iranians that I think those previous plans are not going to go anywhere, frankly. So I think the Chinese, you know, <laughs> You look at the numbers, of the amount of money they're going to spend, you know, U.S. aid to Pakistan in the last 10 years has been five, six, seven billion dollars, and that is a lot of money. But then you start 
coming in with 60 million and it's a different set of numbers entirely. Reiner. So the speaking of which, do you see China playing a greater role and in this region? But also, how are the relations with India? And you've always had a particularly relationship prior. Uh, do you see it improving and China trying try to reach out more further with Pakistan? Uh, I would say to the first point, uh, China already is playing a great role in the region. China is not only investing in its relationship with Pakistan, it is spending a lot of money to uh, build goodwill in Sri Lanka, in Myanmar, in Bangladesh, in Nepal. Indians refer to this in their journal articles as the string of pearls strategy that China is putting around India's neck to keep India contained. That sounds really grim. On the other side, India and China do an enormous amount of trade with one another. China is India's largest trade partner. So similarly to the US-China relationship, there are elements of competition, but also just you know, really vast economic exchanges between the two countries. And the business communities in both India and China, they, they barely even care what's going on politically. They're just doing their thing and making money. And people tend to think that that has, in the long term, a pacifying effect. That's yet to be seen. The two sides are continually building up their forces up in the Northeast, where uh, there's a lot of disputed territory between India and China. The, uh, I did some math uh, in preparation for a lecture a few weeks ago. <coughs> the total amount of territory disputed between India and China is the size of Minnesota. So we're not talking about little itty bitty competing claims. We're talking about vast amounts of territory and they are very aggressively trying to establish their claims. And negotiations are not really ongoing with any particular momentum. Dan? Uh, I, I have a question. The, the existential threat, uh, the reassuring uh, scenario depends upon uh, both sides being, to a, some degree, rational actors. And Pakistan strikes me, and I, I know so little about this, but Pakistan strikes me as, as, as a really dubious candidate for rational actor. After all, they've created in their own midst a terrorist series of terrorist organizations that they cannot themselves control. Uh, politically, they're highly unstable. Uh, why should we? feel comforted by the notion that if they were a rational regime, they would not retaliate? It's a, it's a very good question. I mean, historically, obviously, if you look back at a lot of things Pakistan has done over the years, you do a lot of head scratching, sort of like, what, what was the thinking there? Why is that happening? Um, I do think when nuclear weapons are in the mix, as they have been more and more in recent years, it really does change the dynamics. You know, if you provoke a country, your next door neighbor, and you lose a military conflict, as Pakistan did in, you know, 65 and 71, that's one thing. You know, things will return to some sense of normalcy. Uh, if you endure a nuclear war, obviously the stakes are that much higher, and there really is no evidence that Pakistan is, when it comes to the nuclear capabilities, you know, doing irrational, stupid, saber-rattling types of things. In fact, there's a lot of speculation that the reason Pakistan's efforts have gone into supporting these terrorist attacks is that they still have plausible deniability, right? They're not admitting anything. So when I say Pakistan supported terrorist acts, they flatly deny those things. So there is that element of plausible deniability which suggests that they understand that greater provocations are just not really on anymore in this nuclear context. That's probably a hopeful answer, but that's sort of how I view it. Bridget. So I had a follow up to that. Um, are we using, when, when we, uh, make this assertion that 
Pakistan's military leaders and civilian leaders, I guess is what you're saying, are, are sort of behind or at least supportive of, for example, the Mumbai attack. Is that American intelligence or Indian intelligence that supports that or both? Both. Okay. Yeah, that's pretty established. I don't know if you saw the Frontline episode recently on the Mumbai okay. attacks. The Lashkar-e Taiba is a f very favored terrorist group in uh, the ISI. Uh, and, you know, it's pretty clear okay. that Pakistan's okay. fingerprints were all over that attack. One of the, um, well, watch the Frontline episode. Okay. I mean, it's, okay. it's, pr it's very demonstrable. I know at the time the ISI said, we trained these, these uh, militants at one point for an operation in Kashmir, but we didn't train them for this operation right. in Mumbai, but that's being- Yeah, unfortunately for the Pakistani case, that whole Mumbai attack that lasted for you know, 80 hours or whatever, those, before they were killed, those terrorists were in constant contact with, the ISI. with their guys in Pakistan. Okay. And it it's, makes for horrific listening. Because okay. as they're walking through the hotel, you know, looking for people to kill, their, support, their you know, sponsors are basically saying, do it, go in there, okay. do this, do okay. that. And it's all, it was all intercepted by mm -hmm. Indian intelligence. Mm -hmm. And so there literally, you could come up with a mammoth transcript from that entire operation. And yet they still say, wasn't us, was mm -hmm. a rogue thing, right, we don't right. know, we can't really, they just released the ringleader, you know, the, mm -hmm. the, the planner of the attacks from custody that he'd been in. Um, okay, it's, okay. And then they, one, one other quick point. I yeah. guess a good sign from Pakistan was when their sovereignty, from their, certainly from their perspective, was violated on the bin Laden operation that the U.S. carried out, and they kind of um, took that in stride for the most part and decided not to make a big scene about it. Yeah, I mean, they were embarrassed, and they were angry, and they expressed a lot of outrage. Um, behind the you know, media accounts and stuff like that, and the real conversations that only emerged later, they understood mm -hmm. why we didn't bring them into the loop. They understood that we didn't want to give away information about this ta attack. You know, they, mm -hmm. they just knew. They knew the reasons for it, and they knew that they were good reasons for it, and they wanted that whole episode to fade into history as quickly as possible, because mm -hmm. they didn't want a lot of detailed discussion about well, what was Bin Laden doing in Abbottabad that whole time anyway? And who was protecting him? And, you know, they, they understand that the more that discussion goes on, the worse they look. Um, it does, it has really given them um, some concerns about how sort of delayed their response was in terms of, you know, oh my goodness, this, these aircraft are crossing into our territory, we need to scramble our own aircraft, etc. They've, of course, turned those lessons and fears and concerns to the India side, and they're thinking, oh my goodness, what if they do have some sort of cold start type uh, conventional attacks? They're going to be using air cover, and we better up our game a little bit when it comes to air defenses and things like that, and command and control, etc. Yes? So, um you said that one of the second point you said for policy guidelines was bilateral diplomacy. Yep. And I was wondering after when you said the stuff about China putting in, um, you know, several billion dollars into Pakistan, would that then affect uh, the American uh, relationship? Wouldn't it affect it pretty strongly, especially the fact that the American uh, relationship diplomacy with with the bilateral to have uh, any. Uh, diplomacy with Pakistan when China is really using Pakistan for as yeah no I mean it definitely has an effect the question is is the effect necessarily bad and there are lots of people in Washington who think hey if China wants to invest 60 billion dollars in developing Pakistan great that doesn't really threaten our security in any tangible way and our efforts to come up with aid packages that really make a difference have been pretty futile over the years. There's not a lot of 
perception that this is that this causes that there's a zero sum thing here where if China's influence increases, America's necessarily decreases. Mm -hmm. That's the the people who are really concerned are the Indians. The Indians are very obviously very, very concerned about not only that uh, whole initiative with Pakistan, the Indians are extremely concerned about what's happening in Afghanistan after the US withdrawal. You're gonna have a lot of militants, insurgents, etc., who've come from all over the world to fight in Afghanistan, who potentially could do what they did after the Soviets left in 79, uh, 89, which was to go east a little bit and get involved in Jammu and Kashmir. Mm -hmm. You know, ISIS is now making noises about being involved in the region. It's, it's very, it's all very concerning to the Indians. The U.S., it's not, I don't, it's not, I don't get the sense that, it's sort of like, well, this is something to keep an eye on, but it doesn't necessarily squeeze us out or really threaten vital interests of ours. Yes? So, um, given that, what do you make of the argument that has come out of Pakistan over time? that India is uh, provoking some of the attacks on them from Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. um. Um, you know, they definitely, the two sides have a very intense competition for influence in Afghanistan. The Indians have been doing a lot of things behind the scenes in Afghanistan that are inimical to Pakistani interests for sure. The Indians are, pretty well known to be supporting an insurgency in Western Pakistan and Baluchistan um, in ways that the Pakistanis say, look, you know, you, everybody's talking about us as being the initiators here. The Indians are very active in trying essentially to get this Baluchi secessionist movement to succeed. Um, so, you know, definitely a very valid point. Um, unfortunately, the sort of the, the Mumbai attacks and the attack on the parliament, which were very you know, manifestly supported by elements within Pakistan, those are such high profile things that the attention gets focused on Pakistan because of that. The Indians are a little more subtle in carrying out these sort of clandestine operations, but they do do it, that's for sure. Yeah. Can I ask a follow-up? Is that what do you think the chances are of the um, existential deterrence being diminished if uh, Afghanistan is the ground that gets bombed? You know, I mean, if, if India is, will attack, if we're attacked, if we won't go first, that if the ground is not between, they, on their borders, but mm. further away, that that deterrence is less. It's an, it's an interesting question. Then we get into a whole other kind of set of analysis called extended deterrence. And I, honestly, I'm going to have to plead I haven't really thought about that. Um, I would have to, I wouldn't really want to come up with some sort of a instantaneous response um, because that would clearly be a much more complex situation and a much more uh, subtle calculation of interests. Um, but it's definitely worth thinking about. It's a great question. I just don't want, I don't want to jump out and just. One more, one more question. One more? Yeah. Anyone? Yeah. Want to give somebody else a chance to go here? Yes, sir. Yeah, um, just since we don't know how many weapons there are, uh -huh. or there is, how secure do you think they are, given that there are all these other bad actors running around? It's a really good question. Uh, I actually think um, in India, they are very secure, although there are reports that the Indians can do better in terms of their control of their capabilities and their accounting systems and their security systems and everything. But there is this, you know, the civilian scientific technological community <coughs> does have control of the weapons themselves, while the military services have control of the delivery systems. So there has to be a lot of, a lot of things have to go on to bring those things together. You can't just like steal a nuclear warhead and 
use it. You've got, there's a lot of things that have to happen. Uh, people are more worried about the situation in Pakistan. And people talk about, oh my goodness, what if the Pakistani Taliban were to commandeer some of these weapons or something like that? Um, and there have been some pretty alarmist accounts in the popular media. I'm actually less worried about that than um, most of the things I read. <laughs> we, uh, in the West, we think that civilian control over the military is the natural order of things and the safest and most secure uh, way of keeping weapons contained and safe. I'm not so sure that logic um, extends to a country like Pakistan. And I'm going to be very frank, uh, maybe too frank. In Pakistan, you could really make the argument that the only large institution that works is the Pakistan army. So if I had to choose an institution or an organization, a set of actors to have control over those weapons, it would be the Pakistan army. And they had every incentive to keep those weapons out of harm's way. There have been attacks on Pakistani military facilities and things like that, but their weapons, as far as I can tell from open sources, are not in immediate danger. What happens though, and I'll just add this very quickly, what people worry about is suppose this escalatory process starts, then the two sides start thinking, okay, we've got to get these weapons ready. So they start integrating the weapon systems, they put the fissile cores in the warheads, and they move things so that they're co-located in that context, when you've got capabilities moving around, clearly they're more vulnerable then than they are in their very well-protected normal uh, storage sites. So let's just <laughs> knock wood that that kind of escalation doesn't happen. <laughs> OK, I think we're done. Yes. Thank you. Thank Devin Haggerty for this lecture and for your many contributions to UWC past, present, and future. Uh, this has been our last Humanities Forum lecture for this semester, so please look for the announcement of fall events coming soon. And it's my pleasure to announce that next year's Lippens Professor in the Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences will be Dr. Sherry Waldstein of the Department of Psychology. Who is here right here. Sherry could probably answer your rationality question better than I could. <laughs> Sorry. That's fine. I just wanted to tell you a bit about Sherry. Uh, she is a clinical psychologist who came to UMBC in 1993. She specializes in cardiovascular behavioral medicine and medical neuropsychology. Dr. Waldstein is recognized internationally for her fundamental contributions to our understanding of the links among early multi-level risk factors for cardiovascular disease, subclinical brain pathology, and neurocognitive performance, and their development across the lifespan. In recent years, her work has increasingly focused on identifying the multi-level mechanisms underlying race and socioeconomic status-related disparities in cardiovascular and brain health. She's brought more than $6 million in grants and contracts <coughs> since coming to UMBC has been the director of the behavioral medicine track in our human services psychology PhD program for 18 years. And as of this spring, will have graduated 22 PhD mm. students. Mm. Uh, she works closely with colleagues at University of Maryland, Baltimore, where she has a secondary faculty appointment as professor of medicine. In other words, Sherry Waldstein mm. exemplifies the excellence in teaching and research and citizenship that has characterized all of our Lippitz professors, including Devin Haggerty, and we are delighted to announce her appointment today. And with that, please enjoy the reception.